All right. Well, I think everybody successfully joined. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending another Media Monday. And we want to welcome Chelsea Far Farnham, as, as I stumble over the name there. Anyway, it's, it's a typical Media Monday. If, if Don didn't mispronounce a name, then it wouldn't be. Right? But uh, anyway, Chelsea is joining us from, I think you're still in New York. Is that yep. correct? All right, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Chelsea and she's gonna tell us some, some things about what she does and then we'll have some time for some questions and just have a nice conversation. So take it away, Chelsea. Awesome. So hi everyone, I'm Chelsea Farnham. Uh, yeah, as John mentioned, um, I'm coming to you from New York City. Um, I'm actually, I'm just outside the city right now uh, taking a little bit of a vacation, but I live in Brooklyn um, and worked in Manhattan before um, the pandemic started. So. Uh, have been working from home since then, uh, which we can chat a bit about. But um, I'm actually just now in between jobs. I'm um, about to start a new job at Twitter next week uh, as a product manager. And uh, But I just finished three years at Condé Nast where I was the product manager for the New Yorker magazine. So um, I think most of my talk is going to be about my role at the New Yorker and a little bit about my background. Um, so let me see. I'm going to share my screen. And I pulled up some slides for you all with some visuals that I think will be helpful. Whoop. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, Don and I know each other uh, back from when I used to be a reporter at the Johnson City Press. Um, so I'll talk about my background uh, in journalism and, and how I ended up um, in product management, kind of made a shift into tech. So the topic of this will be product management in a news organization. And uh, I imagine I'll leave plenty of time at the end to, to chat. So, all right, great. So me, Chelsea Farnham, as I mentioned, um, worked at the Johnson City Press. I, I graduated from Milligan College just around the corner from y'all um, in 2010. Um, so yeah, I worked at, as a reporter at the press. I interned there during college um, and I worked at my, on my college paper um, and then was a reporter at the press for about a year. Um, and then I transitioned into technical writing at IBM, um, <clears throat> to be frank. Uh, the, the work of a journalist is very um, hard and impressive. Um, and I, I frankly couldn't take the emotional stress of it. I, I'm so, um, I was really floored by um, the persistence of uh, the reporters at the press and how they were able to um, maintain uh, a level head day in and day out. You're dealing with so much chaos, um, but it's a fascinating job and I learned a ton from it. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that, but I transitioned to technical writing at IBM, which was a, a little bit smoother, more boring job <laughs> that allowed me some more flexibility in my life. Um, and then while I was at IBM, I transitioned into social media management, um, which then took me to New York. So um, I took a class at this place called General Assembly and product management, um, which was kind of my transition into working in tech. So uh, moved out of writing and into, into working in tech. Um, and from there, um, I left IBM to kind of accelerate my learning. So I jumped into a couple different startups in New York, um, one called Bloglove and one called Skillshare. Skillshare does like online video learning. So a lot more um, like tech roles. Uh, and then I kind of came full circle and became a product manager at Condé Nast working in publishing again. Um, so that was really awesome to work with um, you know, uh, first at, for, with for, uh, a Laurentine Vogue, so working with writers, editors, photographers again, um, and then eventually transitioned to the New Yorker where I worked for three years um, and was really closely embedded with the editorial team there. Um, and then I'm starting a Twitter next week. So that's a bit about my like career journey over the last 10 years. Um, and yeah, so I'll go ahead and, and dive into um, a bit about, oh, oh, I've added some photos in here of the New Yorker office, which is fun. I was just there uh, this last week, kind of packing up my stuff. On the right is my desk. Um, I was like the maven of subscriptions. I <laughs> never stopped talking about it ever. So one of our designers uh, painted this like New Yorker tote bag for me with the word subscribe. It looked like they were painted in blood because it was about the level of severity that I was constantly focusing on it with. Um, and then on the left, we have a kind of iconic photo of the New Yorker office. The office is covered in books all the time. Um, and uh, I wanted to show this kind of juxtaposition 
On the left, this is a photo from the uh, art department where they would kind of map out the magazine issue each week. Um, and when I came in last week to pick up all my stuff, this was the issue, the last one that was up on the wall uh, before everybody went home. So there was this kind of iconic cover about the coronavirus um, and these like dominoes that would fall. Um, and that was the last thing they were in the middle of producing the issue when they sent everybody home. Um, so I thought that was kind of a neat photo to capture. Um, and then on the right was our product roadmap. So um, on the tech side of things, they would also keep track of what we were building on the website and what we were collaborating on. And that would factor in, uh, you know, if they had a special, um, like the election was a big deal for us this year. So we, we started preparing in January for all the different tech that we would need for the election. Um, so we had that kind of mapped out from the very beginning. Um, and yeah, so the, you see kind of side by side the print process and a bit of the digital process laid out in the office. Um, so yeah, so I'll go through uh, in this presentation a bit about what product management is, um, what a PM does in a news and media environment, and a bit about the New Yorker specifically, and some lessons that I learned from uh, working in reporting. Um, so yeah. So what is product management? Uh, product management is kind of a new profession. Um, it certainly wasn't something I, that people were studying in college um, when I was in school. I think Stanford produced the first uh, bachelor's degree in product management only a few years ago. Um, so I learned at General Assembly, which was this kind of like tech school that you could do uh, part time while you were working professionally um, and did a lot of reading about it online. Um, but basically product managers are the glue at the center of business technology and user centric design. Um, so your primary objective is to really understand your customer, get to know their pain points, use technology to kind of resolve those pain points um, and do that in a way that drives revenue. So you have to really, you know, in a world where it's like, especially with media, it's really important as, you know, media organizations are trans transitioning away from print or transitioning away from kind of traditional circulation models and thinking about how to make money online. A product manager plays a really powerful role and kind of being the, the mediator in between those different business functions and learning from like, how does the business work? How do the engineers think? What's actually possible to build and how much time does it take? And also thinking about your user and um, you know, what is it that uh, drives people to read the news every day or to log on to your website or to you know, play your crossword puzzles or what have you? Um, what is it that's gonna make them a loyal subscriber and how do you um, use technology to both um, drive them to do those things, encourage more people to do those things and make more money from them doing it. So um, that's a bit about uh, the concept of product management and what the role is about. Um, so I don't have technical training as an engineer, um, but I spent enough time with engineers and designers to kind of wrap my mind around the concepts. And I kind of like, will speak in metaphors with them to make sure that we understand uh, that we're speaking the same language. Um, same with business, I don't have an MBA. Um, but enough, it's, you, you know, you're not maybe an expert in any one of these three things, but you can know enough to translate among the three of them. So a bit about a day in the life of working in product. <laughs> um, so here's some photos also of my life. <laughs> Um, so I find I log on before everybody else. I'm fielding emails and preparing for meetings. There's a lot of meetings. It's a very communication heavy job. Um, so my first morning meeting is with software engineers to prioritize what they need to work on and check in on their timelines, identify any blockers. Um, engineers are the most, their time is the most expensive of anybody on the team. So it's my job to make sure that we use their time efficiently and that they're focused on the most important thing. Um, so I work with them first and I get any blockers or, you know, uh, if there's anybody they need to talk to or any answer, answer, any questions they need answered, I take care of them first and then move on with the rest of my day. Um, and it's a lot of like fielding requests and bugs. So you can see like this screenshot of, uh, you know, something on the website is messed up. That comes directly to me and that and a like a fire hose of other things come to me of people saying, hey, this is broken or hey, we need to fix this. Or like uh, I also have access to all of our customer service emails. So I would make it a daily habit to go through those and check what our readers were saying, uh, if they were having trouble logging in or if they were having trouble reading an article on their iPad or whatever. Field all of that, prioritize the requests, ticket them, prioritize them, 
um, you might be kicking off a new project with designers. So up here on the left, that might be something where like, you know, we do a big brainstorm or we try to map out like um, the UX of a new feature. Uh, so that that's a lot more like, um, like tactile post-it notes, prioritization, brainstorming that you'll work with designers on, on kicking them off on a new project tons of communication. So like, even with those things of like the morning meeting with engineers, removing blockers, making tickets, working with customer service, working with designers, you then have to go and tell all those other people what you just did. <laughs> so it's, it's just this constant like wheel of communication. Um, and then there's an analytical side to it too. So you're checking your numbers every day. Uh, you might be running an AB test to say, to see like, hey, if we make this subscribe button blue or red, which one earns us more subscriptions. So there's a bit of like basic math involved in the job also and like basic, basic statistics to make sure you understand like if you've had enough people run through the test to make it actually be um, significant or was it just coincidence if one thing, one or the other. So there's a little bit of like basic math um, and then lots of prioritization of tasks for the next day. So just like staying organized, always focusing on the most important thing and uh, here's a photo of my dog, Tuna, and I working from home, uh, which is what we've been doing since March. Uh, so there are some like really positive <laughs> parts to the job where uh, there's quite a bit of flexibility um, with your work-life uh, balance if, if you wanna work from home. Um, but yeah, so that's a bit of day in the life. Um, and then specifically in news organization, so I talked a little bit about this, but I, I wanted to pull some clips from, um, these are from like Neiman Lab and, Digiday and a couple different like media uh, business publications. Um, but there's this amazing article, which I've linked in the deck, which I can share with everyone. Um, but the new CEO of the Times talked a lot about how um, she's transitioned to the Times. Oh, sorry, my dog. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's fired up. Um, transitioning the Times to be a lot more focused on technology. Um, and she actually uh, notes in this article that there's 700 people at the New York Times who are working on product teams. So I imagine that's a mix of product managers, engineers, designers. Um, and yeah, there actually, there was a, there's kind of a gossipy article that just came out in New York Magazine today about um, some of the uh, uprising from software engineers who um, are working at the Times, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, and there are a couple more examples that I wanted to pull in is this idea of like how news organizations are using product principles about um, getting readers hooked on uh, habit, which is like a very traditional, like if you read about like the strategy at Facebook or the strategy at like a lot of online gaming tools, it's about like hooking people into these viral loops. Um, and news organizations are starting to tap into that with product management about um, like the, the games department at the Times is a great example of that and how they've expanded past crosswords into like spelling B, things like that that drive you back every day to keep playing are very much like product principles. Um, and I thought this example about like local news being able to capitalize on people paying extra for their subscription if that means they don't have to see ads is a really interesting thing. Like there's no way there isn't a product person involved in that conversation talking about like, what does that mean technologically? Like how to, like how difficult is that to work with engineers to make that an option? Like how do we like add that additional tier of pricing onto our digital order form? Um, you know, how do you A-B test into something like that? Those are all um, situations where a product person either came up with that idea or was probably very involved with it, partnering with the business. Um, so, okay, so taking that same grid, uh, digging in a little deeper, what does this look like in a news organization? So, you know, the business of a news organization is gonna be a mix of subscriptions, advertising, so kind of like your traditional like circulation department and your advertising. Um, and, you know, in the digital world that we live in now, there's all different sorts of membership models that you could um, have like these like premium tiers, like I was just talking about with ad free, or if you want like extra access to writers, or if you want, um, you know, like more puzzles and games or, uh, you know, uh, the Atlantic magazine has a really great program where you can pay extra to um, listen to journalists talk on like Zoom calls and you can like uh, hear them speak to each other and do like more in-depth interviews. Um, so all sorts of like, you know, your creativity is the only thing that's limiting um, you from coming up with a new a member a membership model. Um, and there's also things like commerce or affiliate marketing, which I did a lot of at Allure and Teen Vogue. Um, 
And then within the technology side of things, you know, you've got your paywall that you might have like a metered paywall on the digital side. You've got your ad technology. Uh, so not just direct sold, but like how do you loop in like programmatic ads and make the most of your ad space. Um, you could even, you know, sell different uh, volume of ads to different types of users on your website. So those can all be product decisions. Um, things like email newsletters are a great way to, um, you know, I, we're all aware of how like social platforms um, can make your traffic to your website really unpredictable. Uh, if, if Google changes their algorithm or if Facebook changes their algorithm towards or away from news, that can really affect how many people visit your articles. So newsletters are a great, a great way for, um, for media organizations to own their audience themselves and uh, insert some predictability into those traffic patterns. Um, so those are a very powerful tool. Um, again, creativity is your only limit there. Um, and then there's tons of editorial tools where product people and techno technology plays a core part, whether that's just the CMS where you enter your text or it's tools for copy editors, tools for fact checkers, for editing photos, video, multimedia, interactive storytelling, um, lots of opportunity there for tech to make a, a powerful difference in a, a media business. Um, mobile apps, uh, news alerts, push notifications, you name it, games, um, e-commerce, social distribution. So, uh, you know, I'm sure y'all are all aware of how, you know, the, how a news media organization can really um, expand their reach if they're producing content for Snapchat or even for TikTok or for Facebook or, or Twitter. And that could be, you know, videos that have like closed captioning on them or, uh, you know, like little text cards that have quotes that are pulled out. And all of these things are, you know, things you could put into an Instagram story or what have you. Um, there's ways that tech can get involved to help automate those processes for editorial and help them make the most of the content that they produce on social media. Um, so diving out of technology and then the, the third piece of the pie here, of course, is your user centric design. So really knowing your reader, really knowing your editorial staff, whoever your customer is, whether that's your internal customer or your external customer, what are their needs? What are their pain points? Like, where's their opportunity for improvement and efficiency? Um, developing your audience and that can be you know working with uh you know the folks who are manning the social media accounts folks who are heading up the newsletters like uh what are they seeing are they reaching out to the right people that could even be working with your advertising team to say like hey you know um like our crossword game is doing really well uh among the people who find it but there aren't enough people who are reaching that page. So could we do like some paid social ads about like our crossword or something to try and capture more people and bring them in? So it's, you know, um, developing your audience can go a lot of different directions, both organic and paid. Um, and then building habits. So how can you build those kind of viral loops into your website to encourage people to come back and read more uh, or watch more? Um, okay, so, and this is, you know, this is, a little bit more color, but you know, understanding your users' jobs to be done. Jobs to be done could be like an entire presentation on its own, but it's a really interesting principle. If you Google it, there's like this really great talk from um, this professor who used to teach at Harvard. Um, it's like a Harvard Business Review podcast about jobs to be done. It's really fascinating. But he talks about how um, the example he gives is like the McDonald's milkshake. Uh, and they realized that people were buying McDonald's milkshakes in the morning and they couldn't figure out why this was happening. And then they started interviewing people um, for like an extended period of time and following them day after day, week after week as they were buying these milkshakes. And they learned that people were ordering them in the morning as a replacement for breakfast. Um, and so it was something where it's like they, McDonald's launched the milkshake as like a dessert treat that they expected people to get like with their dinner. And then the user behavior was something totally different. And they realized that people were hiring McDonald's to help them get to work in the morning and stay awake and be full when they got to work. And it kind of launched the whole McDonald's breakfast menu as a concept. Um, so it's, it's, I don't know, the jobs to be done thing is really fascinating, but it's all about just not taking for granted that your users might be using your product in a way that's unexpected to you. And it opens up an opportunity to um, capitalize on that in, from a business point of view. So understanding like why is your why is your user visiting your site? What job are they hiring you to do? Um, and is there any way that you can expand on that? Understanding the levers of your business, uh, whether that's a balance between subscriptions and advertising or, or anything else. Um, 
using technology to create efficiencies uh, for your internal and external customers. So, you know, making your order form faster on mobile or, uh, you know, making it easier for people to purchase subscriptions online, making it easier for your editors to get to print faster. Um, and working with editorial to design and build new experiences. Um, so that uh, ooh, could be all sorts of things, but maybe some of that like interactive storytelling or you know things that you're building for like a special moment, uh, like the election or, um, or anything else. Um, and then making sure that you're always keeping in mind how to monetize those experiences. So that's, that's, that's product management and media. Um, and I wanted to, to share this one example. This is from a, a really interesting slide from Condé Nast. So this is a, a chart about how a single article makes money on Bon Appetit. So <laughs> Bon Appetit's best chocolate chip cookies article. Um, it's a really interesting breakdown of how um, this article was monetized. So the vast uh, majority here is display advertising. Uh, but it also contributed to a fair number of subscriptions. So people who read this article were more likely to eventually purchase a Bon Appetit subscription. Uh, they also had a video uh, embedded into the article and the pre-roll ad from that generated a fair chunk of revenue. And they had an outbrain unit at the bottom that also, and that's, you know, outbrain is a mess, but it's, you know, it's that unit at the bottom of the article that's like, you know, like the trick that doctors don't want you to know about how to lose weight or whatever, but it, you know, it makes money. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the, uh, an example of like how one single article might make money. And you can imagine how, um, you know, a, a product person who's working on Bon Appetit might look at this and expand it out to say like, you know, should we do a whole cookie series and uh, reach out to our advertisers and say like, uh, hey, like for the holidays, we're going to make, you know, all of like Bon Appetit's best holiday cookies. And like, here's, you know, how we can amp up display or, you know, what have you. Or maybe if it drives a significant share of subscription revenue, maybe you might want to say like, hey, normally we give our readers five free articles before we ask them to subscribe, but maybe we'll shorten it for this cookie series because it seems to be effective in driving subscriptions. So maybe we only let people read two best cookie articles before we ask them to subscribe and see if that works for revenue. So um, that's that's one example. Um, so how did this work at the New Yorker? So subscriptions have always been the lifeblood of the magazine. I love this juxtaposition. There's a, a really great book um, written about the New Yorker just called um, Here at the New Yorker, uh, but it had this really great uh, clip in it where it showed this graph uh, from 1946 about how their subscriptions were going up and up and up and they had you know by 1946 they'd reached about a quarter million subscriptions um, the the footnote down here tells us that by the time it reached the 1960s they were at half a million subscriptions um, this article was published in Digiday um, while I was working there early in my time working at the New Yorker about how we were planning to double circulation uh, up to 2 million. Uh, at the time we were at 1.2 million. Um, when I left the New Yorker last week, uh, we were a little over 1.3. So <laughs> we're inching our way towards that 2 million number, but um, still still a fair bit to go. Uh, but I just love how like, you know, this chart about paid circulation is exactly the same language that we're still using today uh, to drive revenue for the magazine. It's like some things change and others, they really stay the same. Um, so a bit about their digital history. Uh, this is a, a screen grab from the Wayback Machine. When the website first launched, it was 2000. Uh, and basically it was only used as a promotion to purchase the print edition. You could only start reading articles online in 2008. So they were pretty behind the curve. Um, and you were only able to read if you were a print subscriber. So you'd have to take like the code on your print magazine, type it into the website, add an email address and that would create a linked account. Um, and you had to do that manually, type everything in. Um, there's all sorts of like mess in there about like if you changed your physical address or something, your account would often get messed up. And um, it was it was very, very, um, what's the word? Uh, I guess just kind of legacy. And then they launched a meter paywall in 2014 uh, where you could read, I think six or seven articles before you would be blocked. So um, I joined the team uh, at the end of 2017. Um, 
as a, uh, they were launching like a subscription growth focused product team. So the objective was basically to take the separate silos of marketing, editorial and technology and put them all in a room together and say like, okay, gang, how are we gonna drive subscription revenue? Let's stop like working in our own separate uh, offices and come together to work on that, which is very wise. I would recommend every newsroom have a team like this. Um, and our focus was to optimize paywall, order form, pricing all together. Um, Cause often you would have marketing who would be dictating pricing and they would say, you know, and this happened at the New Yorker where they increased price by like 60%, but they didn't really tell tech in advance. So the rules for the paywall didn't change at all. Um, and so those things, when they're not coordinated, they just, um, you end up in a situation where you're just not performing as high as you could if you were working in concert. So we wanted to resolve kind of those inefficiencies. Um, you can coordinate marketing efforts, kind of like the example I was saying before about like if product launches a new feature like a crossword, uh, making sure that you're working with marketing to say like, hey, let's do or end with PR, like let's do a PR push about this, let's do some paid social ads about this, um, like just working together uh, to do those things rather than separately, same with editorial when edit says like, hey, we're gonna have an article, um, like we just had an article that um, like Barack Obama published an expert of his new book. And so uh, Edit reached out to both product and marketing, this, this concerted team and said like, how can we make the most of this article that we know is gonna be coming out? Um, and we started just doing that on a regular basis. Um, and introducing data and, and rapid testing into, into the whole process. So it's no longer, and then, you know, that's a cultural change, especially at a, you know, you can imagine at a place like the New Yorker where it's like, you have these very storied editors that um, are incredibly intelligent, incredibly intelligent, um, but aren't necessarily like the most savvy with um, like objectively data-driven decision-making when it comes to things like the business and the website. Um, so there's a bit of a cultural shift where it's like, uh, you know, making sure that editorial is freed up to focus on what they do best, which is write amazing reporting and stories and um, capitalize on that with business and marketing and product. So um, yeah, let's see. So here's some examples of some of the things that we shipped. I'm just checking in on time. Okay, cool. Um, so I would divide the things that we shipped into two categories. Um, I call them carrots and sticks. Um, so carrots are like nice things that we give to readers that encourage them to come back and enjoy the website and um, are the things that we hope will encourage them to not only subscribe for the first time, but also stick around over the long term. Um, and then sticks are things like paywalls, uh, registration walls, um, basically any sort of gating that we say like, hey, you're enjoying this, we are going to like kind of stick you in the right direction towards subscription. So. The carrots, here's some examples. We launched a crossword puzzle. We added a, this really cool feature called partner mode. Uh, and we launched it right after the coronavirus kind of started to spin out. So everybody was at home. Nobody could really hang out with one another. And so we launched this feature where you could play a crossword puzzle with a friend. And so both of you could log on at the same time. You'd like share a link between the two of you and you can solve a crossword puzzle together. In order to do it, you have to create an account. So for every person who like is a subscriber and shares this with their friend, now that person is in our newsletter cycles, they're getting paid promotions whenever we have a sale or whatever. So it also helps to expand the audience as well as providing this really delightful experience that we hope brings people back to the site over and over. Um, we put the caption contest on Instagram. Uh, so this was something where like you would just have to go to the website if you ever wanted to fill out the caption contest, which like if you're not familiar with the caption contest, it's really fun. Um, but they post a cartoon every week that doesn't have a caption and you can just submit what you think would be funny. Um, and if you are among the three funniest submissions, then you get your name in print um, and they pick a winner. So we took that and added it on to Instagram uh, and ended up increasing the total number of submissions each week by like 60%. So um, it was really fun uh, to do this. And there's also like tons of engagement when you go through the comments, basically you just comment your caption with a hashtag 
and people will go through and read all the captions and like them, like even if they don't submit themselves. Um, and the benefit of this from a product and business point of view is anybody who engages with our posts on Instagram gets added into our paid marketing cycle. So they'll start seeing ads in their feed for you know subscription sale for the New Yorker or what have you. So it drives them into our funnel. Um, and again, it hopefully is a nice carrot experience, something they enjoy and come back to on their own. Uh, we added audio in the New Yorker app, and this is a really good like jobs to be done example. Like the top three cancel reasons for the New Yorker are that it's too expensive. Um, it's too many, uh, well, really the top two, <laughs> that it's too expensive and that people don't have enough time. So they say if they're getting print, the issues just stack up and they never get a chance to read it. Or even if they have a digital only subscription, they'll say the articles are so long, I never have time to get to them. So we really thought about that and we realized, you know, people want to hear these stories. Like it's, nobody is not subscribing. Nobody's canceling because they don't like the stories. They just don't have the time. So how can we help people find the time? And so we added um, narrated articles as well as podcasts into our app. So then we started getting some really good feedback from people saying, you know, like, oh, no, now I can listen to the longest articles in the magazine while I'm cooking or while I'm cleaning or whatever. And it kind of resolves this problem of people not having time. Um, so we're hoping, we just launched that recently, so we're hoping it'll take off more. Um, and then things like shareable newsletter pages, this is pretty self-explanatory, but if people like our newsletter, we wanted to make it easy for them to share it with their friends. And then on the flip side are sticks. So <laughs> sticks are where I spent most of my time because honestly, that's where we make the most money. Um, but things like, you know, creative paywall stylings. So, you know, units that collapse and expand, like we add the tote bag, if it's a special holiday, like, you know, we add this ill pricing, like making those customizable and easy to use. And um, tons and tons of A-B testing of um, how many articles do we provide people for free before we ask them to subscribe. And those rules change, like in the course of my three years at the New Yorker, it was very, um, like it was a very blunt instrument. And during those three years, we made it a lot more sophisticated to the point where um, people have very different meters depending on their behavior on the site and their past experience and what they read. Um, so it's, it, that's, that was a very fun um, and interesting project to work on. We also opened up the option of like registration gating. So if we have, oops, uh, if we have example, for example, like someone who we feel like isn't quite ready to subscribe, uh, maybe somebody who's coming to us from Facebook uh, or Twitter, um, but we get the sense that they're like moderately interested, we might just say like, hey, please create an account in order to read. So they can continue to read for free or they can continue to read with an ad blocker on or whatever, as long as they give us their email address. And that gets us, gets them into our like owned newsletters and provides that kind of predictable audience stream that we were talking about earlier. And we created like contextual logins. So if you're playing the crossword, we make these units that are more about like, oh, this is to help you save your progress. So it feels more friendly, feels more in line with the user intent and then we get better conversion rates. Um, and then here's another example of like, for someone who we don't think is ready to subscribe, maybe instead of like throwing them the paywall, we'll be like, hey, do you wanna sign up for a newsletter? Like, are you interested in that? Um, also like different research units, the ability to save stories for later. Um, so those are, those are the, some of the things that I worked on. Um, so some lessons learned from working in journalism and how that made me a better product manager. Um, how to be ready for anything. <laughs> um, when I first started working at the press, I thought I was gonna be writing features because that was what I did when I was interning. And then when I uh, became a full-time employee, um, my editor said, uh, okay, so you're gonna be the nighttime crime reporter. And I was like, I'm gonna be the what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you're gonna listen to the police scanner and then you're gonna get in your car and it'll be 10 o'clock, but you're gonna be out there with your camera taking video and talking to people and on the side of the road, talking to the cops and whatever. And, you know, it was um, house fires and car accidents and uh, meth explosions and um, you name it. And, but it was also like during the day, I'd do these really adorable stories like, oh, the Davis girls peach stand. And it was, it was a fascinating job where it was like, you have to shift gears constantly. And I was always in these like really fascinating conversations with people where, you know, they were an expert at like, you know, you know, maybe like they worked at like, uh, uh, what was the, uh, 
struggling to remember the name of some of the businesses, but if, you know, or like a school board meeting or something where it's like, I'm not an educator. Like I'm not the expert on how the school board operates, but you have to quickly become the expert on that um, really darn fast so that you can explain it to the public in a way that is factually accurate, understandable, comprehensible for the average reader and, um, and helps them learn something that they didn't know before. So, and there, you know, the examples of that are infinite. Um, so yeah, being flexible uh, and staying on my toes is something I learned from reporting, absolutely. Also how to listen to people and see things from their perspective um, and how to be cognizant of their motivations. So, you know, I would never go into a conversation with someone assuming that they were lying or being, you know, uh, you know, bending the truth in any way, but also in order to tell a story really well and to make sure that you're getting all the right angles, you have to think about where they're coming from and why they're telling you what they're telling you. So another very important thing from reporting that ends up being very helpful in corporate life. <laughs> um, I would also say that knowing how to write well is insanely rare, insanely rare and very, very valuable no matter what you end up doing. So um, don't take that for granted. Um, even knowing how to write a good email. I mean, a lot, especially with the pandemic, it's like everybody's remote. So I am writing more than I ever have in my career because you wanna create documents that everyone can see on their own time. Um, so being able to explain a complicated concept in a simple way is like massively, massively important. Um, and I would also say that like, you know, I started reporting Again, I, you know, I'd worked at my college paper, but had very little experience, but I would say use that to your advantage. Like, don't let that hold you back in any way. Like having little experience is kind of a superpower because it gives you the excuse to ask a ton of questions, take people out to lunch, um, ask them what they do, ask them like all the boring questions of what they do throughout their day. And you will learn so much. Um, so learn from both your peers and from your superiors. Um, bring to new technology and skills to the table. I remember, I think I was the first person in the, in the office when I worked at the press to have an iPhone. Um, and I started taking photos and video on my iPhone while I was working there. And I remember the first time I took an iPhone photo that ended up on the front page and it was so cool. <laughs> um, so I would definitely say like, bring those skills to the table. If you know how to like edit a really cool video for Instagram stories or whatever, like bring that to your job. Like because there are going to be tons of people there who like they don't even know the power of that um and it, it's gonna it's gonna make you very valuable in in your job um energy is also a superpower so um you know when you've been working in a job for a while you get tired you get tired of doing the same thing every day and it is so life-giving to have somebody come in who's brand new and fresh and it's just like eager to learn um, and, uh, it'll, yeah, it'll give you a leg up for sure. Um, and then I would also say, just don't let your job description limit you, especially early in your career, take like an entrepreneurial mindset to every job you have, um, look for inefficiencies, look for opportunities. And like, even though it might not be what you're hired to do, like just go out and solve problems wherever you see them. Um, and it will make a huge difference and you'll, you'll be very valued, uh, wherever you go. So I think that's all I had. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I do, but I'll open it up to uh, some of the students on the meeting and see if I'm sure they have some questions. I have a few. <laughs> uh, so um, one of the things I was curious when you were describing a lot of the things that product managers do when you had the, uh, the business and technological Venn diagram showing. Uh, I was wondering if the product managers run the paid search and uh, if they do any sort of like SEM, SEO type work or if they, there's maybe like an ad team that works or like multiple people work on it. I was just curious about that. Yeah, I think it really depends on the size of your organization. So. At the New Yorker, our paid marketing lead would handle all of our paid search. Um, and she would also, she would pair with um, like an audience development manager, which I had no idea what audience development was um, until I started working at Condé Nast. But it's like an entire practice that's focused on like um, understanding where your traffic is coming from, 
the split between paid and organic, um, you're growing your social media audiences um, and advising edit on like what to write in order to drive more traffic. Um, so paid marketing and that audience development manager would work really closely together. So like if we were writing a profile on, you know, what's a good example? Like we wrote one on like Ethan Hawke recently or something. Like they would go reach out for those keywords of like, you know, maybe plays that he had been in recently and purchase those so that who and whoever people would search, ours would be the first thing that came up or whatever. Um, so at least for the New Yorker and Condé Nast, they're um, a separate practice from product. But I can imagine at a smaller operation how a product person could end up owning that. Cool. I have a question. Um, obviously, I know you had some different roles at each um, place that you worked, but I'm just curious what um, just in general observational differences there were between a news news organization and a magazine per se. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's see. The, tur the turnaround time was a big difference. So like, I mean, working at the press, I would go report on something and write one to two stories a day in the same day. Uh, and they'd be in, the, in either online or in print the next day. Um, for the magazine, it's like, you know, you could have, I mean, some of the staff writers will work on an article for months and months and months before it sees print. Um, and the process of copy editing and fact checking uh, can be pretty lengthy. Um, fact checking at the New Yorker is really fascinating, but it's a very robust department and they call every single person in the article and talk through every single fact until they make sure they get it right. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it was a much longer time frame. Um, what else? I feel like the, like the, you know, the, again, because we, there was more time for the turnaround, like the allowance for things like corrections and stuff was like, the bar was just way higher. Like they were very rigorous in making sure that nothing made it into print that wasn't factual. Whereas I feel like with the newspaper, I mean, obviously like, you know, we wanted everything to be factual, but if you needed to print a correction, I feel like it was less terrifying. <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, I feel like I feel like the time the time to turn around was is the biggest difference that I experienced. Thank you. Yeah. See, Brendan, did you say you had another question? Sorry. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I was going to ask you if you had ever uh, done any advertising yourself while uh, working f for those organizations. Never personally. Um, I'm trying to think some examples. There is a like a separate ad tech department. So um, I tended to think of my role um, in advertising as like, you know, I owned the New Yorker website. I knew like the different page types. So we had like the home page, article pages, search results pages, index pages, you know author bio pages, all of that, all of those have ad slots on them. And you can imagine like a grid of like where they all sit. So um, my contribution would basically to be to work with the ad tech team and the ad sales team to make sure that if we were redesigning something that those like little windows for them were in the right places. Um, and then also like, uh, like I was saying, we tried to get to a place where even on a user by user basis, we might like amp those up or slow them down. So maybe for paying subscribers, we might have fewer, like we would uh, inject ads like less often between paragraphs versus for like people who were coming to the site for the first time or from social, we might inject them more often. So it was less about like the content of the ads themselves and more about just the availability for the sales teams and the ad tech team to um, have space. Thank you. Let's see. I'll ask you a question, Chelsea. Um, well, of course, New York City is uh, quite a few miles away from Johnson City, and I mean that more in terms of more than just in terms of distance. <laughs> and so, uh, how did you make that happen? What What was What's What you know? 
how did you end up where you are now? Yeah, yeah. So um, I actually, I had an uncle who worked at IBM and um, it was mostly the working nights at the press that was really hard on me. I, I ended up just very rarely seeing friends and, um, you know, my days were just kind of flipped. Um, and uh, I, I talked with family about it and my family was like, you know, you got to live your life. Like you should, you should do something where you can work day hours or whatever. So um, yeah, my uncle reached out and he said that there were technical writer positions at IBM and he recommended that I try out for that. So um, yeah, I ended up actually working for a contractor that contracted for IBM and I was writing like brochures on like mainframe servers. Again, very classic reporting problem where you're like, I don't know what this means, but I have to become an expert on it very quickly so that when I write something, it's like the authoritative thing on like, you know, IBM mainframe computers. Um, so while I was working for IBM, again, an example of just like, I used Facebook constantly in college to make groups and events and all of that. And my boss was like, we need a Facebook page for IBM cloud computing. Do you know how to make a Facebook page? And I was like, yeah, I can make a Facebook page. <laughs> and like my career just transitioned into social media management simply because of that. Um, and that social media management role uh, had a team in New York City. And so they said, would you be interested in moving? And I was like, hey, why not? So that's how I ended up there. Awesome. It's definitely yeah. a far move. Sorry, what was that, Brendan? I said, it's definitely a far move because I just moved to Jonesboro from New Jersey. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> the opposite. opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have to ask, how are things with the uh, the virus there currently? I know that New York had an extremely, extremely rough stretch. How are things now? It was rough there. Um, I have to say, oh man, a few different things. So yeah, so we all went home in March um, and it was really incredible how um, the magazine production team was able to transition from doing everything to doing everything from home. Um, it was a very tactile process. They still use like, you know, like a, like a, you know, a razor and a cutting board to like slice out how they lay out the magazine. Um, so moving to a digital process for that, like even for the New Yorker was a big deal. Um, but they were able to do it really smoothly without any interruption to the process, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but it was really interesting over the course. I mean, yeah, April and May were really bleak. Um, it was very, very sad what was happening in the city and scary. Um, it was really interesting to read. Um, there are some amazing letters that we got from doctors and uh, nurses and you know people who were trying to help um, like needy populations in the city who just like life did not stop for them. Um, and we got some incredible letters from from those folks who would say, you know, like my New Yorker magazine shows up every week in my mailbox, no matter what, even in the midst of all of this. And it's, you know, comforting to hear these like, you know, words from these voices that are reliable and that you trust and, and feel like friends. And um, it was a powerful place to work in the midst of that because it, it really felt like New York needed um, the New Yorker during that time. And yeah, it was, it was, it was moving, it was moving to work there uh, during that time. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> even now there's starting to be another surge, which is, a, I mean, I shouldn't say surge, we're not there yet, but there's like a hint of a uptick that's a little concerning. So I hope that people will be wise over the winter and that we won't be back where we were in April and May. Like, what is the, I mean, uh, what are the restrictions like now in the, in the city? Like Constantly wearing a mask every time I go outside. Um, we have our dog, so I feel like we go outside more, you know, if you have a dog, you go out more than most. Um, so we, you know, we walk her twice a day and we're out in our neighborhood and we've gotten to know our neighbors really well. <laughs> um, but just everywhere a mask all the time at the grocery store, anywhere you go outside. I don't ride the subway much anymore. Um, I don't leave my neighborhood a lot. Uh, which is strange. I was in Manhattan last week just to pick up my stuff from the office and it felt so weird to be uh, traveling around in the city. I've been just, yeah, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn for most of the time. Oh, very good. Well, sorry, and sorry, I always have to ask about the coronavirus, especially when someone uh, is from a large population center. Yeah, for sure. Um, let me ask, 
what's what would you say is the importance of regardless of your media job just getting what experience you can when you can get it i mean just talk talk a little bit about the power of building on experience yeah um man what can i say i mean when i like when i was at the press again like you know to the point of not letting your job description limit you um i remember like robert hauck at one point asked me to start writing a column and i was like you want me to write a column i'm like 22 years old and he was like that's exactly why we want you to write it is they were like you know we're trying to increase readership among young people. And we think that if we have a column written by a recent college grad um, who's lived here for a while, then maybe it'll draw more readers. So I guess um, don't don't take your youth for granted. Um, like sometimes your perspective is really what makes um, you really valuable to an organization. And like say, I would say like say yes to everything, um, especially while you're young and have the energy. Um, like. That, I mean, that was a, a, a you know, the, me going to Twitter is, it, uh, I said that to myself as kind of a mantra. It's like, I love my, I loved my job at the New Yorker. It was an amazing job. Um, but this thing came across the Twitter and I just thought this is also an amazing job. And, um, you know, given the choice between um, staying potentially too long in one place or opening yourself up to learning something new having a new opportunity, expanding your skill set, like always take the new learning opportunity. And then you can just like grow and expand and expand and expand on your experience. And what will you be doing for Twitter? The similar thing that you did that you did at New Yorker or? Yeah, I'll be a product manager on the home timeline. So um, there's another product manager um, on the timeline who's in charge of like the machine learning and the algorithm. Uh, the data behind what gets recommended to you and I'll be the product manager on kind of the front end experience. So um, yeah, like how, how you receive the tweets that are recommended to you in your feed and like on the desktop experience, kind of the window dressing around the feed. So like the nav on the left, the composer at the top, the featured and trending um, modules on the right. So um, yeah, I'm kind of, I, I have, <laughs> very excited about it i don't know what to expect feels like a very big job um but i'm psyched about it <laughs> yeah that's amazing um let's see before i ask any other questions is there anyone else who ha would like to ask a question all right well let me ask this one before we before we run out of time since we're starting to run a little short of time uh but if you had to offer one piece of advice to anyone like pursuing media as a profession, and I mean that as a very broad term, yeah. what would that be? Oh gosh. <laughs> and you can do more than one if you want to, but. Yeah, man. Uh, oh gosh, so many things, so many things, so many things. Um, okay, I mean, the writing thing is big like no matter like what flavor of media you're going into, like broadcast, radio, like <laughs> social, like things like SEO, um, all of it, knowing how to write really, really matters um, and communicate well. Um, I would say um, like stay up on the latest stuff because it's just, um, what's the word? It can be your uh, like unfair advantage is if you know how to if you know how to use like the latest social media if you're up on all of that um if you have like you know enough html and css to be dangerous like very helpful um i would say um it took me a while to really start focusing on the business levers of media. Uh, I didn't do that right at the start. That's something that like, if I could go back to my time at the Johnson City Press, I would have like gotten lunch with the publisher. Like I wish that I had understood better the advertising and circulation and like the business side of the paper. Um, I feel like that would have been a really interesting learning experience for me to have had earlier on. Um, so yeah, I think, I think understanding that really helps. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not heartened by the commoditization of news. 
feel like local news is really, really important and I want to see it succeed. And that's like something that I'm keeping in my mind as I go to a place like Twitter is like, how do we make sure that um, the New York Times doesn't become the only source for people or like big um, TV uh, cable news organizations are the only way that people get their facts. It's got to be more localized um, because people have to get involved at the grassroots level in order to understand what's really happening in their communities. Um, so I think uh, understanding the levers of the business is what's going to help. Um, you know, the more people that are invested in that, the better. Uh, and the more like creative minds that are brainstorming on how to solve that problem, the better. All right, very good. Let's see, well, we're getting pretty close to the eight o'clock hour, just a few minutes. Any any final questions for Chelsea? Not oh, really. A, yeah, go not, ahead, really a, not really a question, but I just want to say that's that's a pretty cool thing getting to work for Twitter. So congratulations on your new job. Hope I don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> you right. won't. You'll be good. Um, I'm curious if I can ask a question for the group. I don't know if I, I don't if everyone would want to respond or whatever, but I'm curious um, what are what fields are y'all interested in going into? I can start. <laughs> uh, so right now I'm a brand and media strategy master's candidate. So uh, one of the things I'm really wanting to get into is paid search, search engine marketing, search engine optimization. Uh, pretty much anything in that realm, uh, whether it be for uh, a small ad, medium ad, or large ad agency. Uh, I actually just applied for a summer internship uh, with the Smithy Group in uh, New York. So I'm hoping I get it. That's awesome. I um, am currently more on the journalism side. I'm the executive editor of the East Tennessean, which is ETSU's student-run newspaper. And I'm just kind of at a place right now where I'm trying to figure out, which is why I asked you previously about the newspaper versus magazine route, just because I'm interested in both and don't really know which one I want to go down yet. Um, I am very interested in feature writing specifically, like you said you were when you were um, about my age and I just, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's to the point where like, I love writing about people and real people and telling their stories. And I just, I guess I just need to figure out what avenue would be best to do that. I'm also pretty interested in like arts um, reporting cause I'm also a dancer. So, and I love anything art related. So those are also topics of interest, but right now it's more of a applying to grad school or deciding whether I'm going to go right into the field first. Um, but there are all still questions to be answered. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm sure you're going to have lots of opportunities. Um, the one thing I would say is uh, a career is long. And so um, you don't have to, the decision that you make right out of school is not going to dictate what you end up doing forever. So even if you, it's not like feature writing right off the bat, like you very well could end up there eventually and, and learn a lot on the way. Yeah, very good advice. A anyone else? Anyone else want to share? I know we have some people on here who aren't really uh, um, even media field career driven, perhaps. But let's see. And Sheely says, still undecided, but I'm working toward a degree in computer science, so I've considered IT or graphic design and marketing. That's awesome. You'll be. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Chelsea. I was just going to say with computer science, like every door is open. <laughs> and let me flip that back to you. What, what do you see yourself doing? Like maybe, I don't know, let's say 15 years from now. Okay. Any idea? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. A lot of people that I talked to at Twitter or people who have left Twitter ended up starting their own companies. And um, I don't know if I have it in me to do that. It's very risky. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe I'll just stay at Twitter for a very long time. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I already envision having you back on Media Monday to talk about your experiences with Twitter, if you would be willing to do that. So. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. All right. Well, it looks like we're right at eight o'clock. Any final comments or questions for Chelsea? Well, Chelsea, 
let's see. I'm not. <laughs> Ooh, I love that. Wow, wonderful. That's awesome, Amy. Yeah, and let me tell you, knowing Amy, she'll end up making that happen. So. There you go. <laughs> All right, well, Chelsea, I thank you so much for joining us. It's a, a fascinating conversation, and I appreciate you sharing, you know, some insights into some of the business side that, you know, we don't always get to talk about when we're, when we are, you know, doing the typical um, meeting communication classes. And so just fascinating. I really appreciate you taking the time, especially if you're in the middle of a, a move to a new position. So thanks so much. And you're going to do fantastic at Twitter. Just nothing but the best of best of luck to you. Thanks very much. I'll share the slides with you, John, if you want to, if you want to search. Sure, and I will share them with everybody. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us. And as always, I will shut up. And some of you I'll see virtually later. And thanks so much, Chelsea. Thanks, thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.